morning. Our scripture this morning will come from Jonah chapter 1, verses 17. And that's Jonah chapter 1, verses 17. This morning in Sunday school, Pastor talked about us being fishermen of men. Miss Ann's Sunday school has had quite the hit. They went fishing, seeing the fishing rods, and now we're talking about, about Jonah. So we've been about fish all day. Usually on Sunday, I want chicken. Now I think I might get have to get fish. So, huh? <laughs> no, they <that's true. laughs> Jonah one seventeen. I hear people still turning. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Father, we thank you this morning just for allowing us to gather around your word, Lord. We get to hear preaching Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Lord. Allow us not to take it lightly. Allow us to allow it to sit in, Lord. I pray that you repair our hearts now. Father, we our pastor's already given us an idea of what he's going to be preaching about, and I pray that you would allow us to be receptive and open, Father. I pray that you would give us the attentiveness that we need. Bless our children to catch this as well as it comes forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Like Brother Justin said, if you have your Bibles, Jonah chapter number 1. Jonah chapter number 1 is where we'll be starting today. Uh, and I uh, want to say thank you to those of you that prayed for my wife and I while we were gone. We uh, traveled up to a preaching conference. And man... I, I really, I really believe it's important for your pastor to go here preaching sometimes too, and uh, I believe it's important. You know, sometimes a pastor uh, who preaches every week and preaches every time, and uh, as as God has ordained him to do, as God has called him to do, um, sometimes it's just good for him to to get a little bit of a reset to to um, be able to to hear other men of God get up and preach on things that pastors struggle with sometimes, on things that, that pastors, uh, not that pastors are um, any special kind of individual, you know, pastors are just men, um, but pastors sometimes have to battle and struggle with unique battles that, that the church may never know about. They struggle with unique discouragement or unique hardships that, that nobody ever else gets to see. And um, and so that was really good. I appreciate you all being, being gracious enough to... Uh, uh, not not get upset with me when I go to something like that. Uh, it's really good. It, it was a really good time. It was a refreshing time for me. It was a helpful time for me. Uh, a lot of those conferences also come with ministry helps classes, as that one did, and it helped me kind of get get a focus on what brother G, brother Brennan and I are planning on doing with the AV ministry. Just making sure that uh, our audio visual works and, and is done the best way first class for our church. And uh, then as looking forward at, at growth and things like that, it helped, it helped me recenter a vision and helped me get refocused. And I, I, it was a really good time for me. But Jonah chapter 1, verse number 17, <coughs> the Bible says there, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish, <coughs> excuse me, three days and three nights. We know that in this chapter that God had commanded Jonah to go to a place and preach. Where was that place? Nineveh, right? He had commanded uh, Jonah to go to Nineveh and to preach, but what did Jonah do? Did he, did he obey God? No, he fled, right? He went to hiding. He boarded a ship heading away the opposite direction of God's will, uh, which brings us to where we are here. At this point, uh, Jonah has just gone through a storm. The, the, the people have woken him. The, as the sailors woke him as he was sleeping in the bottom of a ship. And they said, the, the lot's fallen to you. What, what must we do? And he said, I'm a servant of the Most High God. And uh, I'm disobeying him. You must cast me into the sea. That is the only way to stop this storm. Now, we, we've talked about this before, that I don't believe that the only way that storm would be stopped is if, if, if he was thrown into the sea. How do I know? Because if all that, G, all, if all that God wanted was Noah, or Jonah's life, uh, he wouldn't have prepared something else for him. He still wanted him to obey God's will. He still wanted him to do the will of God. And so he prepared a great fish. And they threw him overboard, and this, this great fish that the Lord had prepared, the Bible says it swallowed him up. And the Bible says that he spent three days and three nights in the belly of a whale uh, at this point where we hit in verse number 17. I, I began thinking about Jonah in this situation. I began thinking about all the things that he must have been going through. 
Uh, you, you think, I'm sure, that this was not a, a, a big place, the belly of a whale. I'm sure that there was probably some claustrophobia, right? I'm sure, I think we can agree, that there's no light in the belly of a whale. Especially if we read the prayer that, that Jonah prays in chapter 2, we see that he was taken into the deep, right? There's no, if you can go so, so deep in an ocean that there is no light to be seen. Uh, I imagine that over 72 hours, he's probably got some hunger pains. He's probably, he's probably uh, just imagining what a fresh glass of water would taste like. He's going through some trials. He's going through some difficulties. He's going through a hardship, yes, that he brought on himself, but he's going through a difficult time. But you know the overwhelming feeling that I think Jonah felt? And I, I can't say for sure, but I'm willing to bet that Jonah felt alone. That Jonah felt like there was no one else that ever knew what he was feeling. And you know why? Because there was probably no one else that's experienced what he's feeling. He was literally sitting in the bed. You, you ever had something happen to you before where you said, if I tell this story, no one will believe me? Right? <laughs> you know, it's a true story. It really happened. But no one else is going to come to agreement upon that. Jonah was literally sitting in the stomach of a whale, of a, of a great fish. And during this time, uh, I can only imagine how he must have felt. You see, many times uh, I find myself in the very same situation that Jonah finds himself in. Not in the literal belly of a whale, but I seem to remember a time in 2017, June 21st of 2017. I was at a youth conference with, uh, with my wife, who was 28 weeks pregnant, having a great time. We had just, we had just gotten, they, they had taken us to this, um, uh, uh, this boardwalk area that had like the swan, you know, the swan boats that you can sit in and they're paddle boats. And my wife and I with a couple of teenagers, we had swan boat paddled all the way across the lake. And it was just a really great time. We'd eaten, we'd eaten a great dinner. The youth conference was going well. Teenagers were making decisions. Everything was just going perfect. Well, on the way home, my wife told me she started feeling a little tired. My wife's 28 weeks pregnant with twins. Of, of course, you're going to feel a little bit tired. I said, okay, well, I'll watch the teenagers the rest of the night. You go back and go to sleep. No, it won't be a problem. Uh, curfew time comes. I send all the ladies up to the, the, the girls' dorm, and I take all the guys with me to the guys' dorm. About 3 a.m. comes around, and I'm awoken uh, to missing a phone call from my wife. At 3.20 in the morning, nobody ever calls you for anything good. Nobody ever calls you to say, hey, pastor, I just extended the warranty on my car. You know, no, it's, it's always, always a bad thing. I've never one time had somebody call me at 3.20 in the morning for a good reason. <coughs> the phone call woke me up. I called my wife back and she said, Avery, something's wrong. And my heart struck. I had my, I had my wife call my, I called my mom. And I told my mom what was going on, and I said, can you call? She's awake. Can you please call her right now? My mom called her, called me back about a minute and a half later, and said she was going to the hospital. She's having contractions. I take my wife, and I, 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 broke, I looked for speed limit laws to break that day. Uh, I, I broke through every, every speed limit sign, every red light, anything that I could do to get her to the hospital, I was going to get there. The hospital was about seven minutes away. I think I made it in three. And um, we get there. They roll her in and take her to the back. And um, I remember I'm sitting there watching all these doctors and, and nurses deal with my wife. I'm sitting in a chair in the corner. I have no idea what's going on. I, I, I don't know any of the terms they're using. Uh, but they tell my wife that she's uh, six centimeters and 100% effaced. Well, I know six centimeters is only about half of where a woman needs to be. Except my child's head about that time was probably less than six centimeters. And I, I told the doctor, I said, well, that's a good thing, right? Well, she still has halfway to go. And if my wife were in here, she is my witness. The entire, you ever had this time where everything just stops in a room? Everything stopped and everyone turned around and looked at me. And one of the doctors said, no, that means your babies are going to be born today. 28 weeks, I knew that wasn't good. I knew, I don't know much, but I knew 40 weeks was how long it's supposed to go for. Uh, a few minutes later, I had a doctor ask to talk to me. I stepped out in the hallway and he took me into another room. And he told me, he said, Avery, you need to be realistic. Your children may never come home. I'm a first time dad. And I'm sitting there with a doctor telling me my children are probably going to die. 
that there's a good chance that, it, that, I, that I, he said, you need to be strong for your wife, but there's a possibility. And I remember I sat down in that <coughs> room. He walked out and he left. And I was alone. I found myself where Jonah found himself in the belly of a whale. My twins were born, and they were a mere emergency flight into or emergency care taken via an ambulance about an hour away from where we were at. I drove up there. My mom, I think my mom drove me up there. I wasn't really in a condition to drive at that moment. But I remember my wife had to stay at the hospital. She drove me over to, to, to uh, uh, Lutheran General Hospital, I think is what it was called, if I remember right. And they took me back to the NICU where my two little babies were, three pounds and two pounds. And I looked at these little babies, and I sat in this room. There were nurses around. I think my mom was allowed to go back with me. There were nurses. My babies were there. Doctors were there. My mom was there. But I have never felt more alone. It didn't matter how many people were there because I was going through something that I didn't think anyone else could understand. And church, can we be honest? We've all gone through things in our life where we have felt alone. Where we have felt that no one else is going to understand where we are. That no one else can possibly imagine the trial we're in and the difficulty we're in. But there is one, church. There is one, if you're a Christian, if you're saved in this room today, that knows exactly where you are because he sits there with you. I remember as I sat there and <coughs> as I, I find myself in, in almost the exact same situation as Jonah. We don't see these first 72 hours any reference to Jonah praying. If somebody could show me to the contrary to that, uh, I'd be glad to recant that. But we see here, how do I know, uh, how, how do I kind of view that? So we know three days and three nights, a full day is 24 hours. So that's a day and a night. Three days, 24 times three is 72. Look at chapter 2 and verse number 1. And um, I'd like you all to say that first word for me. Go ahead. Amen. Then. It wasn't until after 72 hours that Jonah finally humbled himself to pray. Can, can, I be, can I be honest with you all, church, for a second? When I was going through that trial where I felt alone, do you want to know why I felt alone? Because I refused to pray. I was angry. I was mad. I remember sitting in that room and crying out to God, and I did not cry out in a nice prayer. I was angry. And you know what I said? I said to God, I said, there are drug dealers on the very streets that I drove to bring my children here today that have children that they don't even want. But God, I love these kids. I want these children. You're going to take them away from me before I ever get to hold them? I said, you're, not, you're, you're, going, to, you're, going, to, you're going to take these children away from me? You're... I have all these dreams. I have these visions for what I want them to become. And, and they're going to be taken away from me. They're going to be gone. You know what? It took me a lot more than 72 hours to grow faith for the first time after that. And I was wrong. But do you know why I felt alone? Because I forgot about the one who said in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 5, For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You see, Jonah was in the belly of this whale. Jonah was going through a difficulty. And we may, we may find ourselves in the same place, a spiritual belly of a whale. And we're alone. We're going through a hardship that we wouldn't wish on anybody else, a difficulty, a trial. Some of you have lost your spouse. I can't imagine how you must have felt in those days. We, we, we remember we, we remember so many times these difficult times, but we can see here some things that you and I can do to help us defeat loneliness, 
to help us overcome those times where we feel alone, where we feel like no one else understands, where we, we feel like no one else knows. I find, I find really in this passage, in these ten verses, I find three different things that you and I can do to help overcome loneliness. What to do when we feel alone. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I sure love you. <coughs> God, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for this time you've allowed us to be here today. God, I pray that you'd move me out of the way, hide me behind the cross, Lord. I pray you'd help me only to say what you'd have me to say. I pray that you'd refrain from me anything that I shouldn't. Lord, these people did not come here today to hear from Avery, but they came here to hear from your word, Lord. God, I pray that you, you would fulfill your promise that it won't return void. I pray you'd work in our hearts today. I pray that you'd lead us, guide us, direct us, correct us, whatever we need. Lord, I promise that we'll give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory for anything that happens because you're the only one that's do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I want you to notice the first thing that we can do to help us overcome loneliness. What to do when you feel alone is to pray. Jonah chapter 2 verse 1, we just read the first word. But the Bible says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord God, or the Lord his God, out of the fish's belly. It's important that we pay attention to all the words here. The Lord whose God? His God. Can I tell you, I'm sorry, if you're in the room today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, can I let you know what he is not? He is not your God. Can I tell you? The Bible is very clear that the first prayer that God hears is the prayer for repentance, the prayer, the prayer to ask Jesus to save you. Amen. After that, you get unhindered prayer access. You can pray all the time. But notice, this passage says, that he prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Seventy-two hours had passed. Many times in our trials, we put off the most important thing at getting a hold of God. Many times, Brother James, we try in our own strength. We try in our own power, and we feel like we're going to inconvenience God if we go to Him in prayer. Can I let you in on a secret, church? That's a lie. And you know where that lie comes from? The devil. Because the devil knows that God is the victory bringer. He knows that God's power is stronger than his power. We, we looked last week at, the, at Job. Can I tell you, uh, the devil can only do what God allows the, the, we must understand that God is the one that brings that victory, but he realized one of the most important things he could do after 72 hours in the fish's belly was to pray. How do I know that prayer was one of the most important things he could do? We see these first nine verses are Jonah's prayer to God. And immediately when this prayer is finished, what happens? Look at verse number 10. Look at verse number 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah <coughs> upon the dry land. After Jonah went to God and after Jonah prayed, can I tell you, that boy had been in the fish's belly for 72 hours. The odds of him getting out on, on, alone were pretty low. Uh, let, let's think about this. Uh, the, 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 the feasibility of this fish that stays in the deep, vomiting out in the deep, would probably be pretty high. Would you agree with that? It's probably not very likely that this fish is going to surface near the land and vomit him up on the land. Maybe he comes to the surface in the middle of this lake and vomits Jonah out. So many things had to come to pass for it to happen just like this. But what happened? Jonah went before the Almighty God of Heaven and prayed. You know, many times we trust in a doctor. We have confidence in a doctor. We look and they give a diagnosis or they're able to do things. Uh, I was just at the hospital the other day uh, on a visit. And the doctor there, uh, we prayed and, we, and you know what? We thank the doctor for his work. I tell you, doctors do a good work. Doctors try to help people. That's a good thing. But you know what he told me? So he, said, he said, sometimes... There are things that we take credit for that we can only say are God. You know what? Uh, this, I, I, if I remember right, he was Nigerian. I don't remember who was out with me on that visit, but somebody was. Uh, but, but, <coughs> but, but we must understand that, that we, so many times we look at our world, we look at the trials of this world, we look at the difficulties of this world. Can I tell you, we look around at the politicians. And if we look at the politicians, we're going to lose hope. 
Can I tell you, uh, we look at doctors, but can I tell you, doctors' knowledge reaches an end. There's a reason they call it practicing medicine, right? I, I'm not saying doctors are doing anything negligent all the time or anything like that, but their, their expertise only goes so far. You will reach a point where a doctor says there's nothing else we can do. But my friend, listen, I'm so thankful that we serve a God who, when the doctor's knowledge reaches an end, the Lord's knowledge has just begun. The Lord knows exactly what's wrong with you in your trial. He knows exactly what's wrong with your children. He knows exactly what's wrong with your spouse. He knows that financial struggle and he knows the answer to it. He knows everything that you could ever do. And he has the wisdom. He has the knowledge. But many times you and I, we wait to request to him. We wait until that we're getting overwhelmed. Can I tell you, as I sat there many times, there were two incubators, one on either side, and <coughs> I would open up both of the inside flaps, and I'd put one hand on Archer and one hand on Kinley, and I would sit there for hours with my hands on their bellies, my hands in their hands, too weak to even cry. And I was overwhelmed. The waves of this life were far greater than I could bear. And you know the truth? It was greater than I could bear. Until I reached out to the one who had the power. Can I tell you? Some of you in this room, uh, I think about Miss Kendra, my parents, were there when that trial was happening. You were... You may not have been there physically, but you were there. And the, the people who were there as my witness, there were times where the doctors told us, in about three hours we're going to have to go in for surgery if something doesn't change. There was a, for whatever reason, my children caught the hearts of many people around the world. And I would post on Facebook. See, Facebook can be good in certain situations. Um, I would post on Facebook, this is what's going on. And brothers and sisters, I'm not joking. Thousands to tens of thousands of people would begin praying. And then all of a sudden, the doctors would come back and said, it fixed itself. We can't, we don't need to do anything. And it wasn't just once. As my witness, Ms. Kendra, it wasn't just once. It was three times and four times and five times and six times and seven times where over and over and over and over God's people would go to prayer on behalf of my children. And I would see God answer prayer after prayer after prayer. When you feel alone, the greatest thing that you can ever do is pray. The greatest thing that you can ever do is go to the Lord and, and make requests. Can I tell you, when you know of another brother or sister in this church going through a hard time, the greatest thing you can do is not go and try to tell them how they feel, how you feel or, or you understand what they're going through. That's not the greatest thing you can do. The greatest thing that you can do is come and hit these old things right here, your knees, and go before the Almighty God of Heaven petitioning on their behalf. Friends, I don't know who out of those thousands of people the Lord was listening to. But I'm happy he was listening to somebody. But can I let you know a secret, church? I missed out on those prayers being answered for myself because I was mad. I didn't even see the Lord working at first, even though he worked time and time again because I, was, I felt alone. And I felt like God didn't care. All the while, he was answering prayer after prayer after prayer after prayer. Church, when you're alone, you have to remember that you are not really alone. Hard times will come. Emptiness will come. Loneliness will come. But what must we do? We must pray. You say, Pastor, this is just one story. You got another? Yeah, I do. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, if you would. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. 
Lord, would you be with my voice? Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter number 12 in your Bibles. Acts chapter number 12. We see here, we see here a story of Peter. Acts chapter 12, verse number 3. Give me an amen when you get there. Acts chapter 12, verse number 3, the Bible says, we'll pick it up there. It says, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. What pleased the Jews? Uh, and he killed James, and, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. It pleased the Jews, so he took Peter. Uh, then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaterni, uh, quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to put him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth that same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, <coughs> and the keepers before the door kept the prison. We see her in this situation. Let's look at what this situation is. We just read these, these verses here. Peter was in prison. Why was he in prison? Because Herod saw... It made the people happy that he killed James. So if he saw that that made, made them happy and he apprehends Peter, what is the goal there? He's going to kill Peter, right? You agree with that? You've seen that from Scripture? We see that he was guarded by four quaternions of soldiers. What is that? That is 16 Roman soldiers. Uh, I don't know how much you know about this time in history. The Roman soldiers were elite. The Roman military was the strongest military on the face of this planet. The Roman military uh, of that day would have been much compared to the American military of today. I don't care what the Chinese say. I don't care what the Russians say. I don't care what any other nation says. You come up to bat against America, you're going to get it handed to you. America is still the greatest nation on the face of this planet. I don't know why I feel the need to say that, but I do. Um... But we see the Romans here. These 16 soldiers weren't a joke. If, the, if, if, uh, if Peter was to get out, he was going to have to make it through 16 trained Roman soldiers. I don't know how much you know about Peter. Last time he swung a sword, he only succeeded in cutting somebody's ear off. These Roman soldiers were killers. Death was normal to them. Warfare was normal to them. We see not only was he guarded by 16 soldiers, but he was bound in chains. We see that he was behind... Uh, at least two sets of walls. We'll see that specific. We'll see that he was in, in wards. There were different wards. And he had to process his way through those wards. We'll see that in a little while. But you know, from a humanistic perspective, do you know what we could see from those situations? Hopelessness. 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 Peter, as he was sitting there, the Bible says he was bound that night by, to, two other, to two Roman soldiers. As he was sitting there, and I'm sure shackled to the other to the soldiers, I bet you he felt pretty alone. There were two soldiers there, but not that loved him. There were guards around him. There were people there. He was in chains. He was in bondage. He was in difficulty. But you know what the Bible says? Verse number 5, it says that there was a church there that was praying with what? Look at it. Without ceasing. They were praying without ceasing for, for Peter. They were hosting an all-night prayer meeting because they knew Brother Peter was in a pickle. They knew bad things were about to happen to Brother Peter. And what was going on? Uh, and you say, you say well, I, I'm sure Peter, Peter knew the Lord was there. We don't see Peter laying on the ground crying, doing all those things. But... He, in a physical sense, was alone. But these, 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 these church members, they were praying and they were reaching out to God on their behalf. The church, the, the church uh, called out to someone that could actually do something. Can I let you know a secret? If those church members tried to storm that building, you know what was going to probably happen? In all likelihood, every one of those church members was going to die or be captured. Right? Right? When you fought the Roman army, you better have some skill or some sneaky tactics to win. Because the Roman army was strong. The 16 soldiers that were guarding him, it didn't mean there were only 16 soldiers in the whole area. Just that were guarding him specifically. But what do we see that happens? Let's look at verse number 7. 
And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Oh, rise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. So there's one obstacle overcome. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and second ward, okay, now they're getting past the gates, uh, or, or the, the walls, rather, um, <coughs> they came to the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. So this big gate just opened up for Peter. Uh, and they went out and passed, uh, passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, notice what happens right here. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. <coughs> we saw here in this passage of scripture that the Lord did a mighty thing for Peter. You know, the first thing we saw with Jonah... Jonah did that to himself by disobeying God. Peter was in prison for persecution. He was being attacked by the world and the enemies of God and all of these things that were happening. And can I tell you, friends, you may be under attack by the devil and his minions today. And can I let you in on a secret? As a saved person in this room, you have access to one that's greater than any minion of the devil. You have one that's greater and more powerful than the devil himself. You may feel alone today. You may feel persecuted today. You may feel tried today. And believe me, friend, as the times get worse and worse, persecution will come. Uh, attacks will come. Uh, we're, just, we're just really a few short laws away, Brother James, from hate speech, uh, which really means if you offend anybody, you can go to jail, uh, is really what that means. Uh, we're just a few, uh, a few short laws away from that being put into place, and persecution may come in our lifetimes. And can I tell you, it doesn't matter if the politicians come after you because I know one that's greater. I know one, one day that they're going to bow their knee to and they're going to say, uh, He is the King of kings and He is the Lord of lords. The Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess who Jesus Christ really is. Can I tell you, you may face persecution. You may, you may feel alone because you're persecuted. You may feel alone because you've sinned. You may feel alone, Brother William, just because life happens. Can I tell you, the Bible says the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. Amen. Can I tell you, when you lose someone that you love, when someone you love passes away, uh, I think about my grandfather passed away just, a, just over a year ago now. I love that man. I miss that man. I trim my face every morning with a, with a trimmer I took from his house. And every morning I think about that man. I think about the trips that we used to take to the pizza ranch and eat pizza together. Hallelujah. He liked to eat it. That's my kind of guy. You know what? But death is going to come. To those that we love, we can't avoid it. It's going to come to us one day. Now, when it comes to us one day, our trials will be over. But friend, when you and I lose people that we love, we may be in a trial, we may be in a struggle. But can I tell you, there's one greater than death. Can I tell you, those of your, those, your loved ones that have passed on to glory, there was one that was greater than death. And that's why your loved one's in heaven today. Amen. Because they placed their faith and trust in the one that was greater than death itself. The one who took the keys to death and hell. Amen. Can I tell you, we must, we must remember the God that we serve, the power that the God, the God we serve has. The night, this is literally the night before Peter's life would come to an end. Do you understand that? It says, the, it, it tells us here in Scripture, the night before. I don't know what your time of loneliness is. I don't know whether it's debt. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's debt, but I do know the one that owns it all. Maybe your life is under attack. I know the greatest defender on the face of this planet. Maybe you're in the belly of a whale because of sin. I know one who says he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice how the church was praying. Almost like the Bible 
shows record of itself. How were they praying? They were praying without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, what does the Bible say? Pray without ceasing. This church was fervent in prayer. They had a request that they wanted to see answered and they were willing to pray and pray and pray and pray again because they wanted to see God answer that prayer. And what happened? They saw God answer. Remember what James chapter 5, the end of James chapter 5, verse number 16 says. What does it say? It says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man does what? Availeth much. Friend, you must understand when we're doing right, when we're serving God, when we're obeying God and we're doing the things that we ought to do, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Uh, what, is, what does it mean when we pray fervently? We don't just pray once. You ever been guilty of that before? You pray once and then you never pray again? When we want to see God answer a prayer, we pray and we pray and we pray and we pray and we pray again and we keep praying. You say, Pastor, my bills are due to tomorrow. Pray again. You say, Pastor, my health outlook isn't looking so good. Pray again. You say, Pastor, it looks like a loved one may, may pass on to glory. Pray again. You say, I, I, I don't know all the trials. I, I, I'm just in some trials. I feel lonely. I'm struggling with depression. I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. I'm struggling with my thought life. I'm struggling with whatever the case may be. Pray again. Pray. Pray, pray, pray. You say, Pastor, is it that simple? That is our Father. Can I tell you? That little... Hey, hey, Kenley, come here. Come here, come here, come here. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> this is my daughter. I will protect her with my life. I will provide for her at the cost of my life. I will defend her with my life. I'm a sinner. I'm wicked. I'm a worm. But there's, ladies, there's an almighty God of heaven who looks at you the same way this daddy looks at his daughter. He says, I know she's not perfect. But I love her. And I'm her defender. If you stay close to God, he's got you. Thank you, sis. You can sit down, Archer. Come here. This is my son. You know, what the, you know what I said about my daughter? Same rules apply for this boy. You come after him, you come after me. You try to do harm to my child, I'm going to do harm to you. You rest assured. You say, Pastor, you're not supposed to be a brawler. I'm called to protect my family. You hurt my family, we've got a problem. You can come after my wife, we've got a problem. But God looks down in the same way that I view this child. God views us in holy holiness man you may be sitting here today and thinking i don't i don't know that i can make it there is a god in heaven that looks down with love the love of a father to a son and says i love him do you know what these children can get sometimes that you probably can't get they have special access to this guy right here and as your pastor you have access to me but these children have it in a different kind of way they live in my home. They see me. We speak every day, multiple times a day. <laughs> Do you know what? You know, that closeness, God wants to have that same closeness with you. Amen. Whether you're a daughter of God, whether you're a son of God, He wants that relationship. Come here, come on. Thanks, bud. But church, how do we have that relationship? By going to God. When we, sometimes, you ever, you ever seen somebody before that tries to go to everybody else but never takes it to the one that can really, can really answer anything? You ever, you, ever, you ever met somebody at work that they always want to complain to you but they never go talk to the boss? You ever met somebody like that before? You ever met somebody before that um, wants to complain all about the church to you but never goes to the preacher? Can I tell you? That's backbiting. God doesn't bless that. Right? That's gossip. God doesn't bless that. But can I tell you what God does bless? When we do things the right way. Amen. When we go to the almighty God of heaven, do you know what can happen? Things can change. Even when people don't understand that that's what's happening. Prayer changes things. 
Say, I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what your struggle is. I don't know what your, what your hardship is. But I know one that has the power to fix any struggle, any hardship, any problem, any trial, anything you've ever gone through. I know one that can fix it all. Now see, not only do I see that we ought to pray, pray, but my friend, I also see that we ought to double down. I also see that we ought to double down. Let's look back at Jonah. I should have told you to keep your finger there, but you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Um, Jonah, chapter number two. Jonah, chapter number two. If I ever, if I ask you any longer, if I ask you to turn away from there, keep your finger in Jonah because we're probably coming back. Jonah, chapter number two, <laughs> verse number uh, nine. Jonah, chapter two, verse number nine. Jonah chapter 2, verse number 9. What does the Bible say there? Jonah 2, verse 9. The Bible says, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that, that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. I see when we feel alone, we ought to pray. But I also see that when we feel alone, we ought to double down for Christ. We ought to double down for Christ. We see here that Jonah makes a decision to recommit himself to God. What does he say? He'll say, I pay, I'll pay that I have vowed. Now, we don't know what, what his vow was, but we know that he calls himself a prophet of God or, or, or a preacher of God. We know that he says that, that he's a servant of the Most High God. Can I tell you, when you're saved, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you become his child, but, but we, also become his, we also become his servant. We also become a soldier for him. And you know what? There ought to be times in our life, Brother William, where we make a decision to just recommit ourselves to God. You say, well, I'm still serving God, but we can recommit to do more for God. We can, do, when trials come, when hardships come, when difficulty come, we double down and we say, you know what? I am going to live for Christ. What does that look like? Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. Many of you could probably quote it. The Bible says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And what does the end of that verse say? Which is your reasonable service? Do you know what that says, Miss Kay? Is that God is not asking too much for you to, to be a living sacrifice for Him. Did you know that? Uh, Miss Leah, did you know that God asking you to serve Him is not Him asking too much? Sometimes we, we look at service to God and we think of it as inconvenient. And you know what God says? It's reasonable. Really, what our attitude should be, it's the least we can do. Can I tell you, going soul winning is the least you could do for God. Can I tell you, being in church is the least you could do for God. Being faithful to give, to, to, to further His kingdom, it's the least you could do for Him. Can I tell you, uh, me coming and moving a thousand miles away from home, the least I could do. Some of you have moved from, from that. Some of you are native Texans, but a lot of you aren't native Texans, Right? When you follow God and you do what He wants and you go His direction, the least that you can do is just obey God's voice. The least that you can do is double down and say, you know what, I am going to continue on for Christ. Even though I feel alone, even though I'm in hardship, even though I'm in trial, even though I'm in difficulty, even though my life feels empty and I feel alone, I'm going to double down. You know, one of the quickest ways I have found to stop feeling that way is to serve others. One of the quickest ways that I, that I, why? Because when I double down and I serve Christ more, Christ gets closer to me. You know what, you know what I find a lot of times, Christian? If you're not in your, if you're saved in this room and you're not in your Bible, there's an emptiness that fills your heart. There's a void that only God can fill. But we tell people that before they get saved, right? That there's, there's a God-sized hole that they need. They need God. They need to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. But when you have no relationship with Him, there is still an emptiness that follows. And I find that emptiness to be prevalent, and it often masks itself as depression. Now, I am not saying that if you struggle with depression, you're not right with God, okay? Please understand what I'm saying. There are people who genuinely struggle with that. That's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about the fact that sometimes we do not have a relationship with God. It makes us feel empty, and it leads us to depression, right? It's a symptom of of a lack of a relationship. Not in every case. Once again, we're not dealing with a paintbrush, right? Not in every case. But there are cases in which, Brother James, we feel, we feel empty, we feel discouraged, we feel alone, not because God is not with us, but we have not maintained a relationship with Him. We, we, have, not, we have not kept that up. 
We must remember that we are never alone. How do I know? Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 tells us that we are never alone. It tells us so. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake you, or forsake thee. The devil wants you to feel and believe that you are alone when God says, be content, I'm here. Amen. You know, God doesn't promise to stop all your storms. Did you know that, Brother William? That when you're in a storm in your life, God doesn't promise to calm the storm. But he can calm you. That went over real well. God doesn't all, let me say it again. God doesn't always promise to calm your storms, but he sure will calm you. Amen. Friend, we must understand. I wish I could stand up here and preach to you that life will be great once you get saved, that you'll have no more struggles, you have no more trials, finances will just take care of themselves. All of these things will come to pass. No one you know will ever die. Uh, there, will be no, there, will be no, there will be no difficulties in your life. There will be no, but that would be a lie. It'd be a lie. You know what? Though the storm may be raging around us, sometimes God can just bring us close and say, I'm here. And though the, though the, the, the storm doesn't change, the way we view it does. When you feel discouraged, remember, I am here. In a trial, God says, I am here. In depression, I am here. When you feel alone, I am here. God is always here. We ought to double down in our giving. We won't spend a lot of time on it, but we know Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, where when we have robbed him in our tithes and offerings. We know that when we, when we, when in verse number 9, the Bible talks about how if we rob him in our tithes and offerings, a curse is placed upon us. We receive a curse because we have robbed God. But what does verse 10 say? Verse 10 says that if we give God what we've committed, the windows of heaven shall be opened and blessings shall come down upon us. In so much that we're not able to receive it all. Yes. Can I tell you, when, when those trials come, the devil, will, the devil understands that if he can get you to stop giving in, in trials, what should he do? He should bring more trials around because you don't trust God and it'll continue to bring more trials on. Can I tell you, there have been times before where my bank account doesn't make sense. Where I look at my giving and I look at how much is in the bank account and I say, God, I'm going to have to choose between you getting money and my family eating. And you know what? I have never one time seen where I give what I'm supposed to give to God that my family goes hungry. I've never one time seen it. And I want you to see, lastly, that we ought to listen to his voice. In those times where we feel alone, we ought to listen for the voice of the Lord. Look at Jonah chapter 3, verse number 1. We know, actually, uh, let's look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Before everything happened to him, what happened? The Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, right? So we see there that the Lord spoke. Did Jonah listen this time? No. Well, he, he listened, but he said, No, I'm not doing that. So we see Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. He's just been vomited up after praying and promising God that I'll do what I told you I would do. Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, the quickest way for you or, you or I to find ourselves in the belly of the whale is to ignore the voice of the Lord. Can I tell you, the Lord gives us the battle plan for life. How do I know that? Joshua. You guys remember Joshua? You know the song? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. How did the walls come tumbling down? Is it because of, was it because of Joshua's power? What did he do? You remember that? He was standing there and he saw one standing off in the distance and he said, are you for us or are you against us? And you know what? The Lord told him what to do. And you know what? It didn't make sense, but you know what he did? He said, okay, I'll march around the city. He said, I don't know. They're throwing stuff at us, God, but I'll keep marching. They're trying to kill us, God, but I'll keep marching. God, I'll, you said to do it. I'm going to listen to your voice. God, I... You said to march around. Okay, this is the seventh time I'm on the seventh day. We've marched around. All right, we're going to play the trumpets real loud and we're going to shout and we're going to do all those things. And all of a sudden, the foundations of that very city began to shake. 
And all of a sudden the Bible says the walls fell down flat. How did that happen? It was not because of Joshua's prowess. It was not because of Joshua's power. It wasn't because of the men of Israel. It was because of the Almighty God of heaven because they obeyed the voice of the Lord. And we can see the contrary of that illustrated just a few short verses later where Achan chose to not obey the voice of the Lord. It resulted in dead Israelites, dead folks, and then it resulted in his family being destroyed. It resulted in the punishment of God's people. When we obey God's voice, we see God's hand of blessing. When we disobey God's voice, we see God's hand of correction. I've heard people before say, I'll be the exception. And you know what I've found, Brother Paul? That without an exception, they're not. I had that opinion as a teenager. I can be a rebel and I'm not going to get stung. And you know what? I was wrong. I got stung and I got stung a lot. I got a lot of spiritual scars because of stupid decisions I made. <clears throat> Why? Because I didn't listen to the voice of the Lord. I knew it was right to do and I chose to do something else. When the Almighty God of heaven we ought to listen, speaks, we ought to listen. If He is convicting your heart for salvation today, let me encourage you, listen. You've never been saved before. You don't know for sure heaven is your home. Today could be the day. Listen to His voice. If He is convicting your heart because of sin in your life, listen. God may tell you once, but He does promise that if you're, child, he's, if you're His child, He's going to chasten you. You know, it's far better for my children to come to me and say, Daddy, I messed up. Would you forgive me? Than for them to be caught in their sin. Let me encourage you, if he's convicting your heart for sin, listen to him and get it right. If he's convicting your heart for surrender, I believe mission, missions is going down at an incredible rate. Do you know, Brother Darrell, I don't believe it's that less missionaries are being called. I, I believe it's less missionaries are listening to what God has to say. We're, churches all across America are struggling to find a pastor. I don't be believe it's because less pastors are being called. But I believe it's because less pastors are willing to listen. Can I tell you, church? We must listen to the voice of the Lord. If you're not saved, get saved. If you've got sin in your life, get it out. If you're not surrendered, get surrendered. Times of loneliness will come, but we can overcome if we will pray, if we will double down for Christ, and if we will listen to His voice. Church, something we all can do. Times of loneliness will come. Times of discouragement will come. Times of hurt will come. But in those times where we feel alone, we must be intentional about getting back with Christ. Every head down and every eye closed. Would there be anyone that would say, Pastor, I know that I know that I know for a Bible reason that if something was to happen to me and I was to pass away, I know for sure, 100%, not a shadow of a doubt, that I'd go to heaven. If that's you, would you raise your hand and say, I know that for sure. I see those hands. You can put them down. Would there be anyone that would say, Pastor, if I was honest with you, I am not sure that I'm going to go to heaven when I die. But Pastor, I want to know that. Would you pray for me? Anyone like that? I see those hands. Anyone else that would say, Pastor, I'm not sure. Would you pray for me? You can lower your, head, your hands. Would there be anyone that would say, Pastor, I've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism, but I know I need to. Would you pray for me today? Would you pray for me? I see that hand. Would there be anyone that would say, Pastor, I'm not a member of a local New Testament church. Would you pray for me where God would have me to be? Would you pray for me? I see that hand. Two requirements to, to be a member of a church or, or a member of our church are that you're saved. You've accepted Christ as your Savior. And you've been baptized at a church of like faith. If you believe this is where God would have you to be, we'd love to have you. Would there be anyone that would say, Pastor, would you pray for me when I'm in my times of loneliness that the Lord would help me through them? Anyone like that would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I see those hands all over the room. I tell you, church, you can lower them. I am more than happy to pray for you. But I believe that today we should probably have altars full of people praying for the people that we know that are lonely in our life. If we're lonely, if we know of trials, if we know of burdens, we should help others bear them by praying with them as well.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for this time that you've allowed us to come before you in prayer. God, I pray for those that have raised their hands saying that they don't know for sure heaven is their home. Lord, I pray that you would help them come to that saving knowledge. Lord, I pray for those that um, are looking for a church. I pray that you'd make clear to them where God would have them to be as a member of the church. Lord, I pray that you would be with those who, who are feeling alone today or those who are struggling or those, those who know that loneliness at some point in their life is coming. I pray that you'd be with them. I pray that you'd strengthen them, Lord. I pray that you'd raise them up. I pray that you'd help them remember that you could help them through any struggle they face in their life. Lord, we sure do love you. And God, we're so thankful for who you are. Lord, we're so thankful for all that you are. Lord, and we promise we'll give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray.